Aha! Welcome, man. Long one. I last show of the semester. I'm Ryan Wilson, joined by James Boyd, Will Gerard, Jason Lates. Always behind the camera with UPTV, of course. Got a different angle here. I know. Yeah. I'm a little nervous because it, it appears <laughs> that I'm on camera for once. I like it. Hopefully, like, the camera doesn't catch me picking my nose or anything back here behind the producers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell you, he did that a lot this year, you know, but <laughs> now you're getting the inside scoop. <laughs> yeah, we, we can add in some graphics and make it disappear. Um, but, yeah, I'm back. I guess apparently these guys wanted me to talk about myself. Yeah, why were you gone, Ryan? You left us high and dry You know, I was, I was in my dorm room for the entire <laughs> show. I, I tuned in at, like, 6.10. I'm like, okay, these guys have nothing on the show. <laughs> there's, there's no sound. I try. I envision myself bolting across campus and bursting into the studio. <laughs> I got halfway there, halfway here, and my chair about ran out of battery. So I'm like, well, have a good show. <laughs> um, but anyways, I was in Peoria. Um, of course, as I've discussed on the show, I have to have a surgery sometime soon. So I was having an anesthesia consult. Basically, they, what they do is they look at my neck, because in my surgery, they have to put a tube down my throat, and that's pretty risky. So I realized that no matter which surgery I do, if they just take the rod out of my bone, or if they break the bone and take the rod out and replace it, uh, no matter what, they'll stick a tube down my throat. Um, so if they just take the rod out, they just what they'll do is they'll put the rod right at the, the tip of my throat. So it won't go down the pipes. Um, but I do believe I'll be pursuing that option sometime soon, in the next month or so. So I'll be having surgery. Hopefully it won't be out too long. For the surgery I'm looking at, it'll just be a week. So I'll be back in business and hopefully forcing James into another sled. <laughs> so. Yeah, so as yeah. you all just heard, he did not ditch us for... No. You know, I guess pointless reasons. I guess it was pretty important that yeah, you go to that and it felt get pointless. things figured out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm glad you're glad you're back in studio for our last show of the for semester. The last show, of course. We have our friendly dinosaur here. We don't really <laughs> talk about him on Rolling the Line, but he's always here. <laughs> um, we have a fun show. We this, this should be like a Will Gerard show. I think. Today. I think so. The producer man. Really outdid himself. Yeah. I just had a busy week, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, w- I would believe that. Okay, yeah. Um, finals week. Um, and and then Will comes into the studio with, what is it, like five guests? Yeah, you yeah. spoke with five guests? I spoke with, uh, with five four people. different people for this four different particular people. story, yes. Yeah, so Will did a, a fantastic podcast for us. Like the history of the NWBA, the National Women's Basketball Association, interviewed a few people, which we'll get to hear in a few seconds. And then, in addition to that, well, my gosh, uh, I have to catch up to you. Overachiever. Um, yeah. Um, so you interviewed, just to tease it, Jeanette Nugent. Like, why, don't you, why, don't you, why don't you tease it? Well, um, I had the opportunity to talk to her for a little bit after she went on a tour of Drez on Monday, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, she went there to see a mural dedicated to her husband, Tim Nugent. And, um, and then that afternoon, we had, a little, we had a little phone interview. So that was kind of uh, that was, that was a strong uh, starting point. I actually talked to Mike Frogley the Friday prior. He uh, former men's and women's uh, wheelchair basketball coach here mm-hmm. at the university. Um, someone that is um, real involved with um, Team Canada. We actually played part of that um, interview on Friday for our dedicated listeners out there. So, And then after that, um, who are some other people I talked to? I talked to Matt Butchie. Mm-hmm. He's always a lot of fun to interview. Just got yeah. caught up for a few minutes after practice. Mm-hmm. And then Marty Morse, who um, actually was the head coach of the track program for many years and served as an assistant under Hendrick. Uh, Brad Hendrick, who yeah. was the basketball coach here. 
Yeah, so there, it was it was a real it was a real long conversation actually. I was kind of <laughs> frantically trying to yeah. cut it down for something that we could use for the radio. So there's actually a few um, segments that won't be included. That I thought I, right. I'm, I'm a little upset that won't make the cut, but yeah. you know there's still yeah. there's a lot of content there, stuff we can discuss. He yeah. he, he talked about our good friend Gene Driscoll. Mm-hmm. He told us about his coaching experiences with Stephanie Wheeler. But, you know, you, you'll, you'll hear it yourself in a little bit here after this uh, podcast. Yeah, yeah. So we'll play the podcast, and then we'll jump to this interview with Marty Morris, which is an hour and a half long, correct? It went for, yeah, I almost mean, we, an we hour could, and a half. And I, get the show I, kind of, I kind of chopped it down 20 minutes. Oh, uh, so come on. Right, right beforehand. I hope it sounds good. We'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, didn't get a chance to listen to it all the way through, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, it's, it's a good interview. I man. learned a lot just from talking to him. He's someone good. who's definitely was there, actively involved with uh, para-athletics on this, this campus for many yeah, years. Yeah, he's, he's a big figure, and he... Uh, earlier this year, won a big award from the International Paralympic Committee, kind of a lifetime achievement award. So he's yeah, I don't think they give those out just you know no to anybody. No, no, it'd be nice if I had one, <laughs> but I don't. Well, I you gotta keep going. You have a leisure life. You have you know, got things to do. Oh, okay. I'll try to earn that. that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to jump into this podcast, and as you guys are listening to a twelve-minute podcast. The rest of us are just going to, we're going to listen too. <laughs> we're not going to do anything. Because <laughs> we don't have to talk. It's all pre-recorded. Jeanette Nugent had the opportunity to tour the Disability Resources and Educational Services Building on the campus of the University of Illinois on Monday. Dres was built in 1963 and replaced what were essentially tar paper shacks at the current location. Jeanette is certainly no stranger to the building after working as an occupational therapist at what was then known as the Rehab Education Center before marrying the man who would one day come to be known as the father of accessibility. He was, he had to sign and have the power of attorney for all the disabled students that came on campus. And he was on call 24 hours a day. And he was, at that time, he had very few staff members. If a a student got hurt or was in an accident or was problematic, he would be called. However, according to Jeanette, Dr. Timothy Nugent faced much adversity during his early days on campus. In the early days, we had deans that, well, one dean didn't even want to touch, shake hands when at graduation with one of our, with the first paraplegic who graduated from the U of I, refused to shake his hand because he thought paraplegia was catching. I mean, it was an uphill battle all the way at the beginning. If he would build ramps and put them up to go to, so that the um, classroom would be made accessible for one of our students, and the next day he would find it removed. And this is the kind of harassment he got at the beginning, in the early days. It's very difficult to change attitudes, and um, he spent a lot of time doing that. Nugent overcame these obstacles by working through Delta Sigma Omicron, a national rehabilitation service fraternity he founded in 1948. They got, that's how they got the buses, that's how they got, got many things done through DSO, because, uh they were able to get around. Uh, They they didn't have to go through the dean to um, get things done. And DSO played a very, very important function in the early days. Accompanied by close friends and family, Jeanette visited Dres for the first time in over a year to view a new mural dedicated to Nugent. Just across the corridor and adjacent from Maureen Mo Gilbert's office, who was a coordinator at Dres, 
there's another picture of Nugent. In this particular picture, Nugent's arm rests on Mike Frogley's shoulder. For 16 years, Frogley was the head coach for both the men and women's wheelchair basketball teams at the university and currently serves as director of Wheelchair Basketball Canada's National Academy. Frogley believes his conversations with Nugent shaped who he is today. He came around probably every three weeks, and he would always swing by the, the building dress, and he would always take time out to sit down and chat with me. And in those conversations, he would always share his experiences, the things that he'd, he'd learned over all the years. And uh, it was through all of those conversations that I really began to understand a lot about, one, how you cause societal change and what it takes. And I really began to really understand um, the roots or the DNA of the Dreyer's tradition of the program that Dr. Nugent started. And it, all of those things shaped who I am today. Dr. Nugent always talked about they showed me that it, it takes tremendous will to cause change. What I think is great about wheelchair basketball, and it's one of the things Dr. Nugent and I talked about, is that when a person comes into the gym and they see wheelchair basketball for the first time, they're walking into the gym and they're thinking, they're seeing these people pushing around the chairs and they think this person can't run, this person can't jump, this person can't go upstairs. They think of the things that they can't do, and then they watch a wheelchair basketball game, and as you hear people talking during the game or walking out after the game, they, they start, they're saying things like, well, I just see that person hit that three, you see how fast they were, and you see that person get up after they got knocked down. And now they started to talk about things that people did and not pe things people can't do. During the early 60s, through his retirement in 1984, Nugent went on road trips all over the country with the team on their Greyhound bus. He used to go on these spring break trips down south to play with some of the black teams because <clears throat> nobody wanted, the white teams didn't want to play with them. And so he would take his, the, at that time they were called the Giz Kids, he would take them down and they would play with them and have training sessions on ball handling and all that. And he even slept in, a, uh, in, a, in black hotels because uh, the university at that time had a rule that if you had a student, they had to be chaperoned. He had one black player on his on our Giz Kids team, and so one night he would sleep in the black hotel with, with the black student, and then Chuck Elmer, the physical therapist who also refereed the games, um, would, they would take turns sleeping in a black hotel. Back in 1981, Morrison enrolled in the university with dreams of studying kinesiology and was fortunate to have access to Freer Hall because Nugent arranged the installation of a concrete ramp for the building in time for school, despite the fact that it was without one when Morse visited the campus in July. One year later, there was also an elevator constructed, which gave Morse access to all of the labs in the building. My first impression of Nugent was he was... Um, in charge, very aggressive, and uh, he was a man on a mission to get things done and get them done right. He could have a pretty sharp temper, and um, he, de he demanded excellence, but for some reason, he and I never had a problem. We, uh, um, I would get down to his office and talk to him, um, sometimes unannounced, just show up. And um, a lot of times when people from all over the world would come to Dres, Jim would want to show him around, he'd ask me to come in and do it with, you know, with whomever was uh, here from the 
time he retired to the time he died, he was never stopped moving. I mean, you need to remember he started the battle in Champaign-Urbana on this campus in 1950. And right up to the day he retired, he was fighting it. Morse recalls a specific instance of when he first recognized Nugent's impact on the sport of wheelchair basketball. In 1984, 80, 85, I went to the, uh, to the Nationals and um, Brad Hedrick was unable to make the trip and he wanted to make a rule, there was a rule change that he wanted and um, so I had to give a proposal to the uh, executive committee of the NWBA. Okay, so Nugent's down, he, he, you know, he's president. Almost the entire executive committee of the NWBA was, were all Illinois grads. Let's go! Matt Butchie succeeded Frogley as the men's wheelchair basketball head coach at the University of Illinois. And just like Frogley, he learned an immense amount about society from the conversations he had with Nugent. He had a personality that was just like, he controlled the room and was just an incredible person to just have conversations with. And I loved sitting down and having him tell stories about kind of the good old days in it and just how they didn't take no for an answer. They constantly kept pushing. Everything we have here at the university is because of Dr. Nugent and because he wouldn't take no for an answer. And I think Dr. Nugent's work has made that to a point now where when you're on the U of I campus, you don't think about accessibility. Everything is just accessible. And when you leave this oasis and you go out into the real world somewhere else outside of Champaign, it's pretty amazing to feel like, wow, I was in such a great place. But she makes sure that his incoming players know of Nugent's legacy. What we were really fortunate with is the Big Ten Network made a big documentary about our program. They got a lot of interviews from Dr. Nugent before he passed. Um, so we played that this beginning of this year for the whole group. And that was the first time that we had done that because it's fairly new. And it was great to have the athletes be able to watch it, hear his voice and hear from him and just hear his passion. Uh, so they get an understanding of how great the program is because of him. Nugent revolutionized the sport of wheelchair basketball. However, it is important to note that his contributions extended far beyond para-athletic sports. I got a chance to be around a person that fundamentally changed the world. He was one of the ones that wrote the American Standards for Disability, which were the precursor to the ADA. And that, that's the impact Dr. Nugent had. He was the one that started that first program for students with disabilities at U of I. So every single person with a disability that's gone on to post-secondary education can thank Dr. Nugent for that. He, he shaped that many people. Every single time I go up a curb cut, I have the physical accessibility because of the contributions of Dr. Nugent. I got to sit. I got to chat. I got to spend time with a person that changed history. Thanks for listening. This was producer man Will Gerard for Rolling Illini on WPGU 1071. Welcome back to Rolling Illini here on WPGU 1071. And you, PTV, we're back on camera. Who 12 minutes of hardcore interviewing by Will Gerard as uh, we all just sat here. And yeah, it was hard work, I'm sweating. Yeah, it's nice tough. job, Will. Thank you so much for the interviews. And we have just one more. I might cry. I learned a lot from the, the little audio story you did. Learned a lot from Jeanette Nugent. Uh, I'm not surprised Tim Nugent was a workhorse. Um, and that documentary, as we were talking about, is an excellent documentary. I am in it for a half a second. Uh, he makes an appearance in right. what, one or two he, frames. He's of telling the you all the, the version he's not sharing with us. He tells us he was in it, and then just pauses. So we're all thinking, oh, you're in it, in it. But no. I was in it. <laughs> it wait, it just. It the just camera just happened to catch him. 
not the other way around. That's kind of what happened. <laughs> yeah, they, they set up their, their tripod at the intersection as I was crossing, apparently they were recording. Yeah. So. They said, who is that handsome young man? We have to get him yeah, in, our, in our documentary. Yeah, I'm sure that's how they felt. Yeah. That's, you know, that was, that was the spotlight of the Big Ten Network. They, they made the story around Ryan and obviously Tim Nugent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here's Ryan and, and here's Tim Nugent. Yeah. We might have a dorm named after him, but this is Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tim, Tim is uh, definitely a figure we all kind of look up to and are very thankful for him. And without him, we would not be talking about Matt Bushy and Stephanie Wheeler's success. Um, and, and our show would be different. I think we would still have the show. We would just talk about curling. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, not, not, not feeling that. I'm glad, hockey? Glad. <laughs> the order of events kind of went the way yeah, they did. Yeah, no, no. I think without Tim Nugent, we wouldn't have a show. So thank you, Tim. And I wouldn't have my dorm either. I would live in another dorm, but not here. Um, but we have another interview here. We'll do it with Marty Morris. Yes. And More it, in depth. It's about to start off with me asking him about his contributions as an assistant basketball coach. But like we said earlier on the show, he was a real prominent figure, especially when it came to, to track. Um, there's a lot of this interview that didn't actually make the cut just because mm -hmm. of, you know, time constraints. And it's certainly something we'll readdress uh, next semester moving forward. Maybe even have Marty on our show because they're kind of cool. He's yeah. definitely the guy who's uh, full of a lot of stories for sure. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting how he and uh, multiple other people that we've interviewed so far had that overlap between track and basketball and basketball and track and, right. and how uh, wheelchair athletics is not really limited to just one sport. So right. this is yeah. a perspective on that. Pretty cool. Exactly. All right. Listen in. I'll just keep talking again, as they say in radio. Uh, now we're having some technical difficulties. Unfortunately, the board we're working with is a little wonky today. I think it's ready for Christmas break and some cookies. <laughs> just like me. Uh, it's, it's on Christmas break already. Um, Be before we uh, play this last interview here, uh, do you guys want to kind of go over some of the highlights we had for this semester? Highlights we had for this semester. Um, I have a couple. You have a couple? I don't have any. I'm sorry. It was very disappointing. No, to us. no. no uh, as I was telling you, James, and well, I don't think you heard me. I think you had your headphones in, and I was talking about you for about 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm very thankful for you guys' help with this show. And one day, uh, James is um, uh, working out pulling muscles with wheelchair basketball with Kane. Shout out to Kane Walters. Um, and the next day, James is in a sled. So thank you. Um, appreciate that. And Will, you've got the podcast. Dozens of interviews that I did not do. And, and instead, I was doing some other stuff with TV. Well, I'll, I'll have to thank you for your tireless effort in uh, terms of coordinating some of the interviews yeah. we've had tireless for this show. Effort, oh, I, I sleep a lot. <laughs> well, we, uh, we, yeah, I mean, we started off the show with talking to Tatiana, and yeah. that was awesome. But there have also been a lot of other people that we've had the chance to talk to just because of, you know, your efforts to coordinate those yeah. interviews. So that big shout out to you. People that aren't as prominent as Tatiana, right, but are right. still very important in, in, the, in mm -hmm. the work that we've covered and, and the sports that we've covered and, and the things that they've contributed to their field. So it's been a fun semester. Like you said, I think I heard a lot of body parts <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> going through that workout back in um, yeah. back at the beginning of the semester. Yeah. And obviously, uh, Will got a couple pictures of me on the ice for uh, mm -hmm. our sled hockey in event that we went to. I looked a lot more graceful than I actually was. Thank you, Will. Um, but it was it was fun. I'm looking forward to doing some other crazy stuff and having mm -hmm. my mom tell me that I'm nuts. I sent the, I sent the <laughs> picture of her of me on the uh, sled uh, hockey sled hockeying, and she was like, "What do you do at school? Do you do you ever go to class? Do you do anything besides yeah. you know just you know act foolish?" And I told her, "I'm just living my best life, yeah. you know, just trying to." Have I don't fun. go to class, mom. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I, in all seriousness, I do think going through those experiences, also discussing them, talking to people that we have talked to, 
mm-hmm. it's been incredible just for adding uh, new perspectives to the yeah. way I see things. Yeah, and then back to the Tatiana interview, like that was that was luck. Like, I have tried to get a hold of her for like months, and then all of a sudden Mo gets me in contact with her, and it's like, yeah, he's just calling her up. Oh, okay. Calling her up, no answer, and then like a month later, she's like, "How can come on your show? How long is the show? Oh, it's an hour. Okay, I'll be there from six to seven. All right, well, just sign the wall. Um, uh, great. Let's get a few pictures." Yeah. Uh, I guess I will, I'm not, I'll dress up, but great. Uh, I will come with my casual attire as usual. I got my, I, I have my plain blue shirt again. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, that was uh, incredible, honestly, because when you look at somebody that's accomplished that much, right. and to have them come in and discuss. And also, we got to dive into a lot of things that aren't always, you mm-hmm. know, the first thing you see on a Wikipedia page or something right, like that. Right, with Professor so. Dash, he mm-hmm. was... Very insightful with his great deep voice. Yes. <laughs> he he could, is. He could narrate a documentary, I think. I forgot about yeah. that interview until you mentioned That was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. that was cool. He was definitely, uh, he definitely gave us a lot of tips, too, on how yeah. to cover um, impairments, disabilities, and, mm-hmm. and how we frame what we do. So it was right. cool to hear him talk about that. And obviously, when you have won awards. Not me, know, but him. Yeah, when he's won those, well, yeah. you as in. Yeah, you know, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've already given a shout-out to Kane, but I'd like to also give a shout-out to UPTV. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, you so much, Thank you, Jason. Jason. Uh, thank you, Andrew, yes, for uh, your yes, contributions to our show. Yes, yes. Yeah. You make sure we look good. Yeah, I'm sorry we didn't get you a Christmas present. I, are we a gift enough, okay? <laughs> <laughs> got three of them right here. Good sakes, yeah. Um, but I'm very thankful for everything. Uh, did not expect uh, to... Have a start a radio show net last semester and then this semester on TV. Um, my mistake, sorry viewers, <laughs> to <laughs> for seeing me uh, once a week. Um, but it's been it's been a good good run so far, and look forward to what next semester brings. I'm not sure what that will bring. That's kind of um, how I feel. Yeah. I, I still remember when you texted me over the summer, like, "Hey, yeah, yeah. Boone's radio show. Would you like to be a part of it?" I'm like, "Yeah." I like to talk, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure. I knew that much, <laughs> but at the time I didn't know what I was getting into. Right. And, and uh, like I said, it, it's been fun. It's been cool. I mean, before this show, most of the time I got on the air was to talk about mm-hmm. Illini sports, Illini athletics, and although I, I'm still very passionate about sports and that, but this gives me like a it's a different avenue. Yeah, to talk yeah. About things that aren't always as publicized as. The orange and blue. And we get to hear about your officiating, like, on a weekly basis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You were Which, back at it. It also did give me a new perspective on that because I had always just looked at it from the, what was it, the intramural standpoint. But mm-hmm. there are some events, like I said last week, I, you know, did the event with the group, the kids from group homes, mm-hmm. in, in which um, it's not the, the, the traditional officiating. I think our show allows me to talk more about that and, mm-hmm. and just the – diversity that we cover in sports as far as Paralympics and the things that I was doing refereeing and the Special Olympics when I refereed that. Yeah. So it's been it's been fun. Yeah, yeah. One thing Professor Dash talked about and one thing I've tried to focus on in my uh, reporting, I guess, for this is that we do a lot of the people first reporting instead of like, oh, this person can't walk, but they can do this. Exactly. And look at this and James can't do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have a wrong person on the show then. <laughs> But uh, I think what um, Tatiana brings a lot to the Paralympic movement, and and so does every person we've interviewed, and, mm-hmm. and beyond. The list goes on. And I also like to give a shout out to Gene Driscoll, probably most Gene Driscoll, fiery, passionate, <laughs> like just joyful interview that I've yeah. uh, probably done ever. She was really just do- talking to her kind of gave me a renewed sense of passion for even journalism you know just yeah. the way that she was talking about how committed she was to this have that fire to racing and how <laughs> you got to have that fire you know right. in, in anything you do in life that inner fire as she talked about it and then signed the wall yeah she's uh. got to have a lot of it to win what is it eight yeah Boston marathon so yeah i've lost track First. break her own record uh five consecutive years i believe <laughs> yeah uh, you know just casually and of, of course adam blakeney has been a big help to the show he's mm-hmm. always Saying, what do you need? Well, we need this. Okay, we'll come to practice. We did. We just interviewed him last week. I think I've lost track. Yeah, we sat down with him in an office. Yes, last we went. Thursday. We went to the wrong conference room and 
open up on a open the door up on a, a big meeting. <laughs> Oops, a big meeting of administrators. And For the record, it was not our fault. We it, were given the wrong. It was not us. Not no, it was not us at all. But also along those lines, big shout out to Amanda McGrory for yeah, uh, you yeah, know, yeah. attaching a GoPro to the top of her we head. We promise and, the video uh, is coming down for an interview, and um, it'll be out early next just week. Being a big supporter of our show, you know, very pre- excited. Premiere, aired in a movie theater. This is it. We've been talking about it for three months now. I think it'll be out. It's like the capstone assignment for our, <laughs> for our show. You know, we'll have it out once we're done this, sem- it'll the be this on semester. Netflix here. next semester. Probably not. Maybe. I don't know if there's net neutrality stuff. We might be missing out on a lot of things. <laughs> so we'll, yeah. we'll try to get out before then. Before yeah. the internet before is no longer the internet. The inter- internet disappears. We'll get this thing out. And before the energy disappears... With Marty Morris, here it is. I'll just sit here again. Can you kind of explain your responsibilities as assistant coach under Hendrick? Um, as a certified strength and conditioning specialist, um, I was in charge of all fitness for the men's and women's teams. And I did that from 1982 until I retired in 2000. Well, my retirement was 2009, but I stopped working in 2005 because of an illness. Um, But, uh, so I did all his, we did the training in the gym. I redesigned the gym and brought in all sorts of equipment and uh, we designed our own equipment and the athletes trained. Uh, We were strength training for both uh, basketball and track and field. And then I I did all the the, the uh, chair skill training and the uh, fitness training for basketball at practice. And then Brad Hedrick did all the tactical and strategic uh, coaching in practice. So were you the one that came up with the concept of ramps at the stadium? Uh, Yes, sir. I'm guilty. (laughs) How did you come up with that idea? It just made sense. Um, Although... um, If I had to do it over again, um, instead of doing ramps, I would probably have the athletes go to the armory and push on the rubber floor on the infield of the armory and do line drills, play football, uh, do a lot of pushing on that soft surface. And then I would probably add ramps once a week after about two weeks of training because I think it's uh, there's way too much torque on the shoulder and the elbows and the wrist uh, for a freshman who's coming in who has no strength and conditioning background. Uh, I don't know Matt that well, but um, I coach Stephanie, and uh, so I know her pretty good, and um, what was Steph like as a player? Oh, she was so intense. Uh, Stephanie did the Boston Marathon. Uh, she was on the national team in, ba- in wheelchair basketball, and she comes off the track. And it's like, you sure you want to do this? And she goes, yeah. And she showed up every day. And uh, she, I took her to Chicago. She qualified for for Boston, and uh, I took her out there. It was pretty painful, but she did it. And uh, she's in the books as, as somebody who had done the Boston Marathon, and that's saying a lot. And um, I'll definitely have to ask her about that experience. Yep, um, incredibly proud of Stephanie. And um, the fact that she could juggle two sports, be a, an honor student, and then um, and then go on for grad uh, 
graduate degree, master's degree, and I believe she's still working on a PhD. So just incredible athlete and a great person. So would you say that your knowledge of sports uh, medicine has definitely um, increased then since that time when you first started? It didn't exist when I got here. It was, um, we, for instance, in track and field, a lot of the athletes would just jump in a chair and just go push with no training. Uh, the training was for basketball. And um, so what I did was I, uh, we, used to have, um, we used to have a track in the stadium. And so we'd go in there and we'd do interval training and repetition training and get ready for the games. And um, then we would, uh, we always try to travel over to Columbus, Ohio for their regionals. Again, just to promote the program. And Ohio became a really good state for us for recruiting. And, um, but yeah, uh, between Brad Hendrick and myself, and then we had some great phys PTs who worked in the, in the uh, clinic who were involved with uh, helping out with um, making sure that nobody got hurt. Um, injuries didn't... Um, I cannot think of one athlete ever being injured by overuse or by... Um, just from practice. Um, so, I think a little bit of that has to do with, well, a lot of it has to do with just the quality of the physical therapists that we had who worked in the clinic. Weren't, didn't racing gloves also come along during your time as track coach too? Yeah, um, we made our, we used to buy baseball batting gloves and um, we would tape them up and we would take uh, friction tape, put that on it. And then in 1990, um, we were at practice over the new stadium, the new track stadium over by the baseball field. And a woman came out and she was sitting in the stands watching us practice. And I went over to ask her if I could do something for her. And her name was Deb Harness. And uh, we started talking and she used to work in the laboratories out at Nike in Beaverton, um, Oregon. And um, I showed her the gloves we, went, we had and then I showed her a design for what I thought we should have. And then the two of us worked together to design the harness gloves, uh, which up until the solid gloves that are being built now, uh, were pre they're, still, they're still the standard at the Paralympics. Um, however, Peter Park and Ariel Rawson, they're building new gloves with the 3D machines. And um, again, I attribute a lot of that change to Adam Blakeney, Peter Park, and Josh George. Um, those three had an awful lot to do with the development of the new gloves. Early in the semester, uh, Jean Driscoll came on uh, my radio show, Rolling Illini, and yeah. she talked about how you convinced her to try her first marathon. What made you think back then that she'd be like a successful marathoner? Um, I, was coaching, I was coaching Ann Cody at the time, and Ann was running a high 140, 140 marathons. 
and uh, and low 150 marathons. And when Jean got here after her second or third year, she was hanging. She could easily hang and sometimes beat Cody in training. And it was just a no-brainer. It was just she had everything that it took. Um, she was incredibly strong. Um, when we got around from the track season and I told her that she needed to lose 10 pounds, boom, she'd lose 10 pounds. And um, so we went to Boston in 1990. And well, I went into those, I went into that race convinced and Cody was going to win it. And um, Jean came in, I think, at 143, and Ann came in at 144. And when they came through the finishing shoot, I ran up and gave Ann a hug because I thought she had won. And all of a sudden, uh, Jean goes, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. My dad and my brother were with me, and I go, what? She says, I won the Boston Marathon. And she had the world wreath and everything with her. I couldn't believe it. And so I was, I was really pleased for her. And uh, Jean went on to, did, she did something in, in marathoning that will never happen again. And that was, she set the world best time five straight years at the Boston Marathon. And uh, I think she won it, what, six or seven times straight. And um, then we had some great competitions from Louise Savage from Australia. And um, it took Jean a while, but she got her eighth win in uh, 2000. What kind of sense of pride does it bring you as a coach to see your athletes perform at such a high level where they're winning marathons and gold medals? I was threatened a couple times by the um, head of the USA delegation because whenever we got to the Paralympics, I would always wear my Illinois polo shirt and my Illinois, my regular work clothing instead of USA uniform. Um, and uh, it just, you know, I, I had the opportunity to do so many fun things. It was, I would, um, you know, people, you know, they, everybody tries to add up all the medals. Somebody threw up a number on the wall down, down in the training center. But I know, I know there's, uh, I coach more people than that. Um, but I never... I was so intent, well, on the next competition that I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time pondering what we just did. It was, um, I think if you talk to Coach Frogley, you get the same response, is after you win a game and you debrief your athletes, and you go over what we can do better the next time, your mind immediately shifts to, okay, what do we need to do to be better? And for instance, we used to come home from the Paralympics, and a week later we'd be doing the National 10K in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And that was as important to us because, that was more important to us because the winner would get sometimes three thousand, four thousand dollars. So uh, that was real important to the athletes. So um, I regret it sometimes that I didn't sort of take it all in. I never. I tra I've traveled all over the world, but I never really did any sightseeing because I was working. Um, but I have an incredible amount of pride uh, with what Adam Blake is doing. 
Um, he personifies um, the excellence that Nugent demanded from us and wanted from us. Um, he's a great ambassador for the university. He and his athletes are great ambassadors for the university. And um, so uh, I take a lot of pride in uh, helping Adam out a little bit, getting him involved in coaching, and uh, in just coaches' education. That's another thing we started here. Um, Gene Driscoll and I with track and field, wheelchair track and field, is we ran coaches education clinics for 10 years, and then we ran a coaches certification program for about five years. And uh, unfortunately, um, because of my health, I had to uh, step away from it. But um, yeah, I was fortunate. I got a phone call. Oh, I can't remember. It was probably in the uh, oh 2000. From a woman in Maryland who said she had a daughter who was really talented, and she told me she was going to send her out over my Christmas break so I could work with her. And it's like okay, and uh, Tatiana shows up, and she was I think a. Uh, Either in eighth grade or ninth grade. And so we put her on the rollers. Um, I work with her twice a day for a week. And so we worked in the weight room. We worked on the rollers. And then when she wasn't doing that, she would go to basketball. And um, she... Uh, when she, even even when she was in ninth grade, she was an incredible athlete, and uh, it was just and I just knew that if as long as she had great coaching, and that's why I'm so glad that um, in 2004, her mom asked me to coach her for the get her ready for the Paralympics, but um, I was in and out of the hospital so much during that year. There was no way I could do it. And uh, her, uh, I was able to get a friend of mine from uh, Team Canada, Peter Erickson, to come down to Maryland and help coach her. And then uh, in 2005, when Adam came up here, um, he was down in Atlanta. He was doing an internship. In what June of 2005, when he came up, um, Adam immediately, you know, went out and uh, recruited. We really didn't need to recruit her. She knew where she wanted to come to school. And uh, I'm just amazed at Tatiana. And Amanda, um, I coached Amanda uh, her freshman year for a semester. And um, my last two athletes, Josh George and Amanda, Amanda McGorry, and both of them were just incredible people to coach. And uh, nobody in the world has a stroke as pretty as Amanda. And um, Josh George has done everything humanly possible to be the best. The one thing I want to finish on is the transition that we made from Nugent to Hedrick as our director of Dreads, and then um, Hedrick had been the athletic director, and he was moved from the athletic director to the director of Drez. And Maureen Gilbert was able to step in as the athletic director. And if I made any contribution to this university, it was hiring Maureen Gilbert. 
um, she just lives for the program. And she'll do anything possible to help a student. Um, I've gone into Driz in the middle of summer on a Sunday. And here she is working. And it's like, what are you doing here? Go home. Be with your daughter. No, I need to get this stuff done. We've got camp going up next week. We've got to get everything in order. And she just, amazing person. And always overlooked. Well, uh, thank you for your contributions to the sport. I'm sure there are plenty of athletes out there who uh, share the same uh, gratitude, and they, you know, they probably have, they probably credit a lot of their success to what you did in your time here at the university. Aw, Will, you're so sentimental. That's sweet. Oh, Ryan just trolls us. Whatever we do, no matter what, he always, he's always trolling. <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> Will, very quickly, what did you learn from that interview? Or your podcast and research as a whole? Yeah, you did a lot. I nice. learned a lot over the week. about. Um, I learned a lot about the history of the wheelchair basketball program here. I learned about um, track. I learned about accessibility in general. I mean, one thing that... Um, Morse talked about in his interview that didn't make the cut was he talked about how there was how much the campus has really changed in terms of there being curb cuts everywhere and how um, in, in like parking he talked about how there was one practice during the winter where it was like basketball was at the arc and it, there was like a blizzard and he got stuck in like the <laughs> snowbank and I, it, I mean I don't know it just kind of it kind of reminded me of the one time that you had to get your your chair charged up too but it, I mean obviously a very different circumstances yeah, yeah. and just yeah. um well I'm trying to think of some other things here there's there was a lot. There was just that um, that I learned. I mean, obviously, I, one thing I want to say, I reiterate, is just uh, I want to thank uh, Maureen Gilbert for um, how she's uh, helped with the show. I know she's a big fan. She's someone who has uh, worked with us in terms of uh, getting in- interviews, and she definitely played a big role in helping mm-hmm. me with my podcast. So I'd like to thank her for that. And I know that uh, Morse was uh, equally as thankful for for you listeners out there who just heard there at the end of that. Uh, Q&A there. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're not going to go into eight overtimes now, I know. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, after doing that assignment, I definitely want to uh, learn more about the history of Drez. I know it's, we, we talk about that facility a lot on our show, but yeah, it, it seems yeah. there is, there's a lot there. A lot that's happened over the past, you know, six, 60, 50, 60 years or mm-hmm. so since it first started on campus. Exactly right. A lot to... Uh, dig through in the archives. I wish I had more time. No, no, it's an interesting place. And I think we're going to call it a wrap for this semester. So for one last time on Will and the Lion Eye, this, this semester we'll be back next semester with more. Happy holidays, by the way. Happy holidays. Yes, happy new year. Um, we'll see you in... All that. All that. We'll see you in three weeks. This has been Will and the Lion Eye on WPG 107.1. Will Gerard. Right I'm there. James. Are you James? <laughs> you know, 18 weeks, I still don't know your names. <laughs> Jason Leggett and Andrew. Thank you guys with UPTV. I'm Ryan Wilson, and we'll see you in a few weeks. Bye.